In this video, I'm going to give you relatively non-technical definitions of 20 important AI terms. So if you are someone who's interested in artificial intelligence, but you can't always understand what people are talking about, this is the video for you. Hi everybody, I'm Bruce Lambert from How Communication Works. This is a channel where I teach you about communication skills so you can improve your relationships, succeed at work, and be more confident. Well, if this is a channel about communication, why am I talking about AI? Well, I've been thinking about and studying AI for a very long time. I took my first graduate course in artificial intelligence in the fall of 1987. Three of the first four scientific papers I ever published were about machine learning. And then my PhD thesis, which is called A Connectionist Model of Message Design, is about a neural network model of language production. So I've been thinking about and working on artificial intelligence for almost 40 years. I'm not a computer scientist. There are many people who know a lot more about modern AI than I do, but I know enough to help you understand some of the basic terms, and that's what I'm going to do for you in this video. Let's start with some core concepts. The very first term is just AI. AI is the acronym for artificial intelligence. It was a term coined in the 1950s or early 1960s, and it had to do with using computers, which were new at the time in the post-World War II era. Computers were brand new, and the early computer scientists wondered, can we make computers do things that human beings do, the intelligent things that human beings do? And in the beginning, these things were like play chess or prove theorems or solve simple logical problems. And they figured, if we can make computers do intelligent things that human beings do, this will be a kind of artificial intelligent, that is intelligent machines, a non-human form of intelligence. Hence the term artificial intelligence was born. The second term is neural network. Now, this is a term you'll hear a lot in relation to modern AI. It comes from a biological metaphor. So biologically, in our own brains and in all mammalian brains, there are networks of neurons connected to one another by dendrites and synapses, and neurons process information by sending electrical signals to one another. And in this way, they could recognize patterns and produce all the cognitive properties of thought, at least in human beings, and reason and perception. So computer scientists in the 1950s and 60s asked themselves, can we create an abstract model of these neural networks? And they did by creating nodes or neurons and connections, which were like synapses, to other nodes. So a neural network is a mathematical abstraction lying at the heart of all modern AI systems that has an architecture or a design that is at least metaphorically analogous to the human brain, especially nodes and links or nodes and connections, which correspond to neurons and then dendrites and synapses. The third term is deep learning. In the beginning, neural networks only had an input layer and an output layer. The, the earliest computer neural networks were very simple. They had two layers. They were called perceptrons. Eventually, the first neural network that I programmed in the 1980s had three layers, an input layer, a hidden layer, and an output layer. Modern neural networks have tens or dozens or hundreds or even thousands of layers. And so the, the main innovation in the early 2000s that led to modern AI was the hardware and the software that made it possible to train these very, very deep or multi-layered neural networks. So a deep learning network is one that uses modern hardware and software to train neural networks with many, many layers. And depth refers to the number of layers. The fourth term is large language model. Now, as you may know, modern AI systems are trained on sequences of text or tokens. Think of a token as a word, even though it's a little bit smaller than a word in reality. So what a modern language model does is it scrapes trillions of words of text from the internet, and then it trains how to predict the next token. So if it sees the phrase to be or not to, it guesses that the next word is be. Or if it sees the phrase how are, it predicts the most probable next word is you. Even though it could be how are things, how are your family, et cetera. But it predicts the highest probability next word. So any system that does this, they call a language model. Now, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, people had this notion of a language model and simpler ways of modeling language, but they were always used to predict the probability of the next term given some set of terms prior to that next term. What happened in the early 2000s is the hardware and the software got better to where you could not train on a vocabulary of hundreds or thousands or maybe low millions of words, but Modern large language models like ChatGPT or Claude are trained on trillions of tokens of text, hence large language models. The fifth term is vision model. Now, as you probably have seen by now, AIs can not only sort of speak in language, but they understand 
images as well. So in the beginning, these models were trained on sequences of text and they could predict the next word and then have all sorts of other capabilities based on next word prediction. But at the same time, people were working on images, that is both comprehending images, translating an image into words, and then transforming one image into another image, translating words into images. So these things are sometimes called vision models or sometimes vision language models because they process visual mathematical representations in the same way that they process textual mathematical representations. The main difference is that image models or vision models are trained on image data rather than text data or some combination of image and text data rather than just text data. So how do these things work? This next section of terms talks a little bit about how these models work. The sixth term is training. Training refers to the process of adjusting the weights or connections between these nodes in the artificial neural network so that when you present it with some input, it produces the correct output. I can't go into all the detail of how this works, but you can look around the, uh, the YouTube or something if you want deeper explanation. But basically you present the model with an input and it produces an output, but the output will be a little bit wrong, especially in the beginning. The connections in the beginning are random numbers. So you present an input representation, it produces the wrong output, but you know the right output. And so you can propagate backwards an error signal that allows you to adjust the weights so that next time you present this input, it'll get closer to the correct output. And that entire process times trillions of episodes of learning is called training. GPT in ChatGPT stands for Generative Pre-trained Transformer. And this pre-training is the process I just described. The seventh term is parameters. You'll hear somebody say that, well, ChatGPT has hundreds of billions of parameters. Parameters are just the number of uh, nodes and connections that are in this artificial neural network, this mathematical abstraction. Think of it as just a giant matrix of numbers, a giant Excel spreadsheet with rows and columns, except in this case, there may be hundreds of millions or even billions of, of rows and columns where the total number of parameters in the, is in the hundreds of billions. So the parameters are just the values on these uh, connections, especially the weights that connect the artificial neural neurons to one another. That's the parameters. The eighth term is context. Context refers to the size of the input that can be presented to the AI model when you're prompting it. So in the beginning, when ChatGPT came out in uh, late 2022, the context length was a few thousand tokens or words. Now in April of 2025, Google Gemini 2.5 has an input context of more than a million tokens. That means you can input like the contents of an entire book and it can relatively accurately process even enormous number of words. That's what context means, the size of the input that you can present to one of these models. The ninth term is inference. Inference is what happens when you present a prompt to a model and it produces an answer. Remember before I talked about training, that's what happens behind the scenes before the model is made public. But once the all the parameters are trained and the model is just used, you present a prompt and it produces the output, that process computer scientists call inference. Term 10 is a, a jargon word that I love to hate, and that's the word compute. You'll hear AI researchers talk about how much compute it took to train the model or how much compute it takes to uh, deliver the model as a service to people over the web. Compute just refers to the computational capacity or infrastructure to make the model work. And because these models have hundreds of billions of parameters, it takes a lot of computational capacity, both to train them especially, and then to deliver them as a service to hundreds of millions of users. So compute just means the amount of computer infrastructure required to make the models work. The 11th term is GPU or TPU. GPU stands for graphical processing unit and TPU stands for tensor processing unit. Amazingly enough, one of the big breakthroughs in artificial intelligence research came in the early 2000s when researchers in Canada especially figured out you could use a graphical processing unit, which NVIDIA had made to help video game processing, image processing in video games flow more smoothly. Well, these researchers in Canada found out in the early 2000s, you could use these GPUs designed for video games to do the math uh, to train neural networks. It turned out that the structure of these GPUs was just such that if you configured your software the right way, they would do the computations necessary to train these very large deep neural networks. So those are GPUs, graphical processing units. TPUs, made popular especially by Google, are called tensor processing units. A tensor is just a mathematical abstraction. Think of it as a matrix, again, like an Excel spreadsheet with rows and columns. Tensor processing units are just CPUs, specialized computer brains, uh, that are designed especially to process these mathematical abstractions, matrices of numbers called tensors. Both of these are important hardware advancements that allow for the 
capability of modern neural networks. The 12th term is API. It stands for Application Programming Interface. You might sometimes hear people say, well, I use the API to communicate with ChatGPT. This means rather than using the web interface, which most people use, you go to the web, you type openai.com and you get it to ChatGPT and you enter a prompt, you can write a computer program that bypasses the graphical user interface and talks directly to the AI model and the AI model passes a message back over the network. That's called communicating with the, the model through the application programming interface or API. And all the major models now have an API which allows programmers to communicate with them so they don't have to use the graphical interface. The 13th term is a prompt. A prompt is just the text that you enter into the model to produce an output that you want. It's often a question or a comment or a document or an image. This prompts the model to produce an output, hence the word prompt. The 14th term is reinforcement learning from human feedback. This is a mouthful. When these models are initially trained, there's a tremendous amount of knowledge in them from training on predicting the next word in trillions of words of text. They turn that sequence prediction information into this tremendous abstract uh, body of knowledge, but they don't produce answers in a format that human beings necessarily like very much. So reinforcement from human feedback involves human raters or human judges looking at the output of the models and coaching the model to produce outputs that human beings prefer more. Sometimes you produce two answers and you ask the judge which one is best. Sometimes you produce an answer and ask the human rater or human judge to rate the quality of the output on some scale. But in this way, you coach the model, you, you reinforce it to produce answers that are in a format that humans like most. The 15th term is alignment. This is a term you'll hear AI safety researchers use. It means making the behavior and values of the AI model consistent with human values or making it so the AIs don't destroy us. So alignment means aligning the values and behavior of the AI model with the values of human flourishing. The 16th term is hallucination. So these AI models, they train on predicting the next token in trillions of words of text. And in this way, they develop this incredibly rich abstract representation of all this written human knowledge. But when they search it, it's not like the way Google searches or the way that you can search a database for a precise entry. Instead, they have this very abstract knowledge abstracted from trillions of tokens of human text, but it can't be searched precisely the way the database can be searched. Instead, it's approximately searched. They take your prompt and they essentially do an approximate search in this vast abstract knowledge. As a result, they sometimes come up with answers that are wrong and they sometimes completely make up facts that don't exist. And when they do that, it's said that the model has hallucinated. The 17th term is red team. This is another term you'll hear AI safety researchers use. A red team is a team of human researchers that tries to get the AI to do things it's not supposed to do. So the AIs are not supposed to tell you how to make chemical weapons or nuclear or biological weapons, and they're not supposed to tell you how to hurt other people or to damage anything of human value or property or anything. They're just They're basically not supposed to do anything that's harmful. But the red team tries to circumvent all the safeguards that were built in to see if they can make it do harmful things. Things. And in this way, the red team can help strengthen the safeguards. The 18th term is just the name of the main companies. So OpenAI is the name of the company that makes ChatGPT. Anthropic is the name of the company that makes Claude. Google is the company that makes Gemini. Meta or Facebook is the company that makes Llama and a family of other models. So these are the main players, especially OpenAI, Meta, uh, Google, and Anthropic. The 19th term is multimodal model. You'll often hear that some of these models are multimodal. In the beginning, the simplest large language models were that. They took language as input and they produced language as output. But computer scientists quickly realized that you could represent images in a similar way, you could represent audio in a similar way, you could represent video in a similar way as you represented language, and you could use the same basic neural network architectures to train image models or video models or audio models as well as text. And now, as you probably know from using ChatGPT, you can input an image and it will output text. You can input a text and it will output a video. When the models can use different modalities, that is text, video, audio, etc., we call them multimodal. The 20th and final term is a term you hear AI safety researchers use, and that is P doom. This is the letter P and then parentheses on the word doom. This means the probability of doom caused by AI. There are a decent number of AI researchers who think there is a non-zero probability that AI will lead to human extinction. And 
When you estimate that probability, let's say you're a pessimistic AI safety researcher and you think within 10 years, there's a 25% chance that human beings will be wiped out because of AI. Your P doom, your probability of doom due to AI is 25%. So there you have it, 20 terms that run the gamut of what AI is and how it works. I hope you found this sort of thing useful. If you want more content on AI, I use it all the time in my work and I'm happy to talk about it more to introduce you to how I use it and what it does and what the implications are. If you found this video to be useful, please give it a like, subscribe to the channel, share it with your friends. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next time.